All right, perfect. So thank you everyone uh, from being here. Uh, I'll start by presenting myself. As I'm uh, Pascal Blanchet. I'm a VP of solution at MaestroVision. I've been working for MaestroVision for about uh, a bit over 15 years now. We're in uh, the broadcast industry, uh, and we've been in the broadcast industry since about 25 years at the company here. Uh, I've worked on various projects, mostly involving uh, workflow optimization and also product development for the company. Um, so uh, today we'll focus on workflows. Um, since we're a smaller group as well, uh, if ever you guys have questions you know, during the presentation, don't hesitate, just raise your hands and I'll try to answer them uh, right away. Uh, it's uh, one of the advantages of being fewer people, we can make it a little bit more uh, dynamic. All right, so today we'll cover, uh, well, the ever-changing uh, complexity and reality of today's uh, broadcasters, uh, what the workflow process is, uh, because I want to make sure that everyone uh, you know, understands what we're talking about, because their workflow is sometimes used as a word, uh, kind of a general word for many different things. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the benefits. That one is usually a bit more self-explanatory. And then we'll dive a little bit into the nuts and bolts and go into the various phases. So the analysis phase and the solution and change phase. And if there's any questions at the end, we'll take them at the end as well. So workflows. I mean, you're, everyone here is involved in broadcast in some ways. So you know that when you start out uh, a studio, a broadcast station, or any kind of project, you know, it's all well laid out. You decide, you know, you're gonna have your one system here connected to that. You're gonna send files that way. And it's all pretty clear and pretty well laid out, at least at first. However, you know, as time passes by, those, uh, well, sturdy, uh, large camera that we see at the top here, they, you know, they start breaking down. You want to have something smaller, something more modern, something better. And then you change a few equipment. Sometimes you do in-place replacement. Sometimes you add new equipment. And as time goes by, your workflow starts to look more like this. Um, what is interesting, however, to note is even though when you look at it from a top view, it looks very chaotic. However, it works. Um, and that is kind of the trap with workflow. Uh, the problem with workflow is most of your stations, you know, you work because if you stop broadcasting, obviously you would no longer be on air and you would no longer be in business. So you have to keep things running. So from a further, you know, a further view of uh, the system, people may think, oh, everything is fine. There's no problem. But when you start looking at it and you see that it's this level of complexity and, you know, crisscrossing wires and people sending files left and right, you start wondering, but how does it work exactly? It's kind of, uh, it's nice that it does, but you realize that if you change a little something, everything can fall down simply because it's starting to be too complex and too intertwined. Uh, one of the things also that's been driving the changes lately is the, the changes and trends and the, um, the things that cons uh, customers are expecting of broadcasters. Because we all know that the video and the way that we consume it has changed a lot in the last 5, 10, 15 years. Um, first of all, video on demand. You know, 20 years ago, there was, well, there was such a thing, but it was more niche and, you know, people were, were very happy to listen to linear TV. Today, <clears throat> a station without video on demand, people are scratching their heads and, you know, wondering, well, but you know, from what rock did you crawl out from under? Are you from 100 years ago? Or, you know, what's happening? People are expecting to have video on demand available. Um, <clears throat> things like Netflix, you know, they basically put the rental store out of business, as you all know. Um, I have a few numbers, you know, and they're growing fast because in 2013, 30 million subscriptions. In 2021, they were at 220 subscriptions. That's not nearly, not uh, exactly 10 times, but they're getting close to 10 times the number of a uh, subscriber in about 10 years. That's phenomenal growth, you know, that most uh, most of us would like to see in our own businesses, but we do not get. So then that means also there are other players out there, like YouTube, for instance, uh, 2 million billion users uh, per month. That's actually a number that's, a, I think, one or two years old. So that's probably more today. And in 2020, there were 500 hours of new content every minute that was being uploaded to YouTube. Uh, of course, of those 500 hours, most of it is uninteresting, low quality, and overall crappy content that nobody will watch. But you know, you only need to have uh, half an hour every minute, and you do end up having quite a lot of content that people will watch. 
And in the end, what it does is it creates more choices and it opens up the possibilities for the, the end consumer of the video. And in turn, what that does is it pushes a lot of pressure on traditional broadcasters in order to compete, but also keep up with those new offerings so that the people are still watching them and not turning away to those new platforms. All of those changes, they, they will generate the complexity I was talking about before. Um, also, the another thing to keep, uh, keep in, uh, in mind is all of the changes I've talked about, we've all seen them, we've all lived them. However, for the newer generation, particularly the C generation and younger, so those are people that were born with computers, so about 80, 85 and up, uh, born in, in 1985, sorry, not being 85, of course. Um, those people are used to all of that technology and all of that offering, so they take it for granted, and anyone who's not offering it to them, they will walk away and go elsewhere. With older generations, um, it varies a lot more depending on the person owns, you know, level of uh, technicality and how used they are to it, but there's a big gap for those younger generations. So in the end, what that means is all of those new demands, they create new, new, uh, new pressure on your existing infrastructure and on, on what you're doing and the way that you work and the service that you're offering. And those need to con continuously evolve. That means if, but if they evolve, it means you're, oops, sorry about that. Uh, it means that if they evolve, you need to continually change them to improve them. And when you do change, every time you change something, you may end up breaking something that is currently working, but which you do not want to do, obviously. Um, as I was saying before, workflow is sometimes used as a general word. I just, so I just want to take a moment here to highlight what workflow is not. Uh, workflow, it's not a software or a specific technology. It's not a way to manage or move files. It's not a cabling diagram. Uh, and it's not I, I saw also a quick way to save money. It will allow you to save money, but it's more of a mid to long term investment. It will not magically, you know, and quickly in a few days allow you to save 20% of your budget doing the same thing. Um, there are sometimes great improvements that can be applied, but you will need a bit of time in order to implement those changes. Also, workflow, sometimes people think that it's only, you know, a concern of a C level executive uh, that is very high level. However, the technique used in uh, workflow can be used at any level. Of course, the scope will be different, but they can be adapted to various levels in order to improve ways that you are working and in order to plan for the future. Um, so what workflow is, uh, first of all, I wanna mention, it's not something new. It's not something I invented. I wish I did, but uh, it's been used actually since uh, about uh, four, nearly 50 years now. It started in the manufacturing industry, uh, moved to other like chemical transportation and other heavy industries. And then it was also adapted to the business world to do business development. Um, so the traditional workflow and process improvement is really, you know, you have uh, like in a, in a plant, a manufacturing plant, you have all those little conveyors, you know, where do you send which product, in what order do you do what, in order like, a, for instance, a car assembly plant. How do you do what step in which order? So that's the traditional workflow. Of course, the way that we use it in broadcast is different because what we do is different. So workflow is really all, all about how information flows. And I use information in a broad sense. So information can be just you know, a piece of knowledge, but it can be a file, it can be a report, it can be a request from, uh, from someone. So it's really how, that, uh, how does that flow? It allows you to know your business and to know your business needs. And once you, do, you know all of that, you're able to identify and solve bottlenecks. And overall, you're able to improve the way that you work um, in order to you know, maximize where do you put your efforts, how, where do you put your time to improve things. Well, sometimes you have some things, they're not perfect, but they work and they don't affect anyone else than, let's say, one person or one tiny aspect of the business. So you are better off you know, focusing on other areas that will have a broader effect on the way that you work. So now that we've covered a little bit you know, what uh, workflow is and is not, we'll start a little bit more about, uh, we'll dig a little bit more into how do we do it. There's basically three phases 
and uh, they're all important in their own accord. The first one is a little bit shorter of a phase. It's about establishing the goals, and then we move on to the anal analysis. And at the end, we have uh, to uh, propose an improvement and to actually implement that those improvements. About the goals. So it's very important when we talk about workflow to first start with sitting down and making sure everyone is on the same page about what do we want to achieve. Of course, you know, everyone will agree that we want to improve things. That's a given. No one wants to make things worse or more complicated than they already are. However, why do you want to improve things? Is it simply to work more efficiently because you want to save time, it's because you want to improve quality with this, uh, having the same number of people. You know, you have a certain size of a team and you just want to have a, a product that is higher quality, but you do not have the resource to add more team members. Is it because you still have the same team, but you have new needs, new technology? We talked about, you know, producing VOD, producing content online. Or do you want to do that without adding extra team members? Do you want to offer a new product? Uh, or do you have an expanding business, for instance? Are you opening up new stations? Uh, and are you adapting to new ways of working? For instance, remote working. That's actually one that was uh, lived by uh, most of us in the last few years. Uh, the way that you, know, that you work when you're physically in the office versus if you do remote working. Sure, you can just take one way and just you know, copy paste it and say, now instead of being in your office, you're going to be in your home office. It probably will work. However, since the whole context is different, you can question yourself as to what other changes you can do in order to make that different situation work better for you and allow you to, you know, not fight the change and not be able and being able to do to work more smartly. Um, so that's really the first uh, the first step is to do that. You know, understanding, make sure the person doing the workflow analysis understands exactly where are you heading and what is the end goal um, that obviously is something that is usually done between the person doing the the, the, the work and the management or the person you know, ordering the work so the client from, from uh, my perspective um, and of course those goals can change slightly but the um, one of the main reason also that it's important is one of the main reason that uh, workflow projects fail it's usually because you know management has one understanding and the person doing the work has a slightly different one. And yes, you're improving things, but you're not improving the things that would give the best result given what the other person thinks they want. So it's very important to go over those. Once the goals are clearly defined, then we can move on to the analysis phase. So the analysis phase is a little bit uh, long, is longer than the goals, but the goals, you know, that's is very important, but it's one, two meetings. It can take a week, but it's not that long. The analysis phase is something that takes more time because it is about looking at to how do you work today. It is also usually the phase that most people think that they can skip that, oh, I know already, you know, how my business work. I don't need to do an overview. I'll tell you how it works. And and they, they basically say, oh, we can shorten you know, the time needed to do the work. However, I would say that analysis is really one of the most critical part of workflow uh, improvement. It should never be skipped because it's all about avoiding bad surprises. Uh, I'll take a quick analogy. Let's say you, know, you have a house and like every house, you have a kitchen in it. This is your kitchen. You know, it, it's not horrible, but it's not the greatest. It works, you know, there's running water, the counters, but you know, it's, it's not what you dream of with, when you think about your dream kitchen. You would like to turn it into this. So sure, you can go and buy out all the material, take, you know, your hammer and your saw and start bringing down the walls to make the room that you need. But if you're not careful and you haven't, you know, identify which are the support walls, well, you may end up with this, which obviously is, well, most of the time, not what you want to do. Um, it, so it's the same thing with workflow improvement. Uh, when you start improving things, it implies that you change things. When you change things, if you don't know what other elements are tied into it, <clears throat> you can end up in a situation, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, where you are actually breaking something that's used to work. 
And sometimes when we do workflow analysis, we do find out very interesting uh, things that people forgot were working that way. Um, sometimes it's little details, you know, sometimes there's a specific file that is being sent to another person, but there's also a fourth or a third person that is also looking at that file for side reports and things like that. And if you change that file, then you're going to break that secondary workflow that you may not have known about. So when we do the analysis, uh, it, it's all, as I was saying, it's all about goals, uh, but the analysis is also about scope. So you have to decide how big of a scope are you going to work with? Is, the, is it only usually in a broadcast situation we center it on master control? Uh, there are situations where we can do it different, but that's more you know, the classical approach. So you start with master control. Who else is going to be <clears throat> involved in the analysis? Are you going to talk with production? When talking about production, are we only going to talk about uh, you know, editing, or are we going to go all the way to the you know, directors and, uh, and the, the whole production workflow? Then there's traffic uh, sales when you have a commercial station, of course. Are you going to work, see how they work and how they send information to master control? You can limit the ana analysis only to you know, what, are, what is coming out of the sales department, like the sales order, basically, that are being sent to the, the, the master control and traffic. Or you can do a broader analysis. Um, are we going all the way down to distribution and looking at the way that distribution is done? So it really depends, ultimately, on what the goals were that you're able to scope the project correctly. And you always want, once you decide, you know, the core scope, you always want to talk with at least people surrounding that core scope. And the, so the bigger the scope, you always want to add the outer ring that I call, you know, people around it so that you know what is coming into what you're actually looking at changing. Um, one of the very important, most important thing about workflow analysis <clears throat> is you need to talk with the people. Never use only you know, a questionnaire or a list of existing documents. Um, and do not limit yourself to talking with just with management. Uh, you do need to talk with management, but you also need to talk with the actual people doing the work. If you don't, you'll always have surprises. Uh, even the best managers, sometimes you know, they believe that some part of the business works a specific way, and you talk you know, with the person doing it, and it ends up being very, well, slightly different. And sometimes there are key elements that are different and that you absolutely need to know about. Uh, you need to learn about the how and the what, but most importantly, what you want to learn about is the why. And when I say why, it's not about you know, asking a person why he's doing that and to justify himself. It's to understand why he was, be, he was told and why he's doing it. Because let's be honest, most employees, you know, they want to do a good job and they are given instructions and they will take those instructions and interpret them and do the work as best they can given those instructions. But if no one corrects those instructions, that person can continue doing the same thing over and over. Um, a quick anecdote that I had on one of my projects I worked on, uh, there was a, a person preparing, uh, like extracting data, sending it to a second person who was generating a report, who was sending it to a third person for review and for use. The catch was that that third person actually had taken their retirement about a year and a half ago. So they were sending that report to an email address that nobody was reading. And so basically, and we had a question, OK, so who else uses that report? And the answer was no one. So, so ultimately, you know, that, that one is kind of uh, it's, a, it's a funny anecdote. And I'll be honest. Most of the time, you know, you will not find people working for completely nothing like that, but it can happen. And but usually it's a little bit more subtle than that. So, you know, sometimes it's a part of the report that you no longer need um, a subset of it, you know, that was used at some points. So it was sent maybe to another system that no longer exists, but that content is still being created and it takes time and effort to do that time and effort that can be used for more, you know, uh, to better use when uh, redirected. So that's why the why is very important. And again, I want to stress this. It's not why as to, you know, you, you're not, you don't want to challenge the person. You really want to understand who told them to do that and why they're working that way in order to understand the reason for it. Um, analysis is always about actors. 
So people, system, companies. So what do they do? How do they do it? In what order? When they do something, what are they waiting on to do to start doing it? And once they've done the action that they're doing, what they're generating, who are they sending it to? So it's about actors and artifacts. When I talk about artifacts, we're talking about files like Excel, XML, video files, reports, uh, emails even. So anything that is being produced is an artifact. Once we've taken you know, all of those information, we, we sit down and we lay it out all in a plan and it will give us a eye level view, which looks like this. This is from an actual project I did a couple of years ago. Um, and so in here you see, you know, you have uh, media management, uh, media management was sending, they were tape based at that point in that workflow. So they were sending HD cam to master control uh, and master control was sending information like as run logs to prepare reports and all of that. So that gives you a high level view of how the information flows between the various groups. And then all, each of these boxes, they're exploded in order to see a more detailed view where you see like this would be box number four. So the one here, uh, what, what's going on inside there? Then you have basically one, uh, one person and the one system and you see what are the tasks that that person does and where he's getting the information or the everything that he needs in order to do that task. So you're able to have a, a better understanding on who's waiting on what and what you need to do those tasks and also to look at are those tasks needed and in what order are they done and why they're done in that order. Um, <clears throat> once the analysis is done, the work is not quite done yet. A very important part that is often overlooked is you need to present it and you need to present it to the, actual, to the workers, the one that you've interviewed. Because you know, as good as you can be, you can always have overlooked something and they're the people who gave you the actual information and they have the knowledge of how they're working ultimately. So the job is really more to lay it out and format it in a more plan kind of layout, but you need to validate that the information is correct and it will allow them to pinpoint you know, where you may have gotten something wrong, when you may have forgotten something and you're able to correct the diagram. After that, you can show it to management, uh, ensure that you know, they recognize their own business. Um, if they don't, it can end up being a quite an interesting situation, you know, where the person learns. Usually people will always learn a few things, that's for sure. But, you know, if they learn all of it, then you can wonder what's going on in that business. But uh, usually management will, you know, discover, oh, that, that person was doing that as well. Oh, that's interesting. And, you know, but you can confirm that their view of it is correct. And if the, the way that they were thinking it was working is different, then they can validate, you know, was it them that they had the wrong impression or was it you that got it wrong? Um, also, at the, when you're presenting the analysis is a good time to confirm the goals. So because at this point, all we've done is really look at, you know, how things are done. There's no change that have been implemented or that have been proposed yet. So you want to confirm the goals because, you know, if, since, the project was launched to today, maybe the goals have changed slightly. Maybe before, after seeing you know, the way that it works, it has rang some bell, it has given them IDs, or they don't want to go at some place, or you, know, you want to make sure that you, the goals that you got at first are still valid. Then you need to establish a timeline. That's, as in any project, that's very critical, uh, because if you don't, uh, of course, they're not, you know, they don't have to be highly precise, but you have to have a time frame at minimum, because if you don't set a time frame, the project will simply never happen. Um, <clears throat> once that's done, then you go and start the third phase, which is uh, proposing improvements and starting to implement them. So improving a workflow is about taking the anal analysis and basically identifying the weaknesses. So identifying, let's say, a point where Someone for that specific task is waiting on basically everyone else in the business. So uh, if one person is late, he cannot start working. So that would be a critical weakness, a critical bottleneck that you want to eliminate as much as possible. Um, also, when, once you identify those weaknesses, the weaknesses can also be more broad. For instance, uh, if you're let's say in a traditional tape-based workflow, if you see in the, the, when you look at the current situation and you see there's no one making any copies of those tapes, 
and they're just kept on a shelf, well, you know, that's a weakness because if there's a fire or any problem with that room, you basically lose all production. If it's a risk that they want to, they're ready to take, that's fine, but you know, it needs to be clear that it is a risk. And uh, once you've identified those weaknesses, it, the, um, it's important to come up with a list of action items. So every action item, there can be more than one action item, but they related to the same weakness, but they all need to be related to at least one weakness and they address that weakness. And when I say action item, they're you know, something actionable that you can do and you can, it's a small project, for instance, say, uh, replace uh, cabling in Studio B, for instance, or you know, replace uh, the video server with a new version that supports H.264 instead of just uh, DVC Pro. So it, it can be very, it needs to be rather precise so that it's really something you know, that you can give uh, to someone as a project and expect it to be done in a relatively small time frame. Some of them are longer, but you don't want to have action items you know, that are large projects that are going to take a year to complete. They need to be smaller milestones. You also need to come up with a proposed sequence in implementing them. Um, so I was saying each action must contribute to fixing a weakness. It needs to be concrete, uh, but it also needs to be ordered in a logical way. Usually, you know, the you want to identify the biggest weaknesses. Unfortunately, those tend to have action items that are longer to implement. But you also, but if you have you know something as a big weakness and that has an action item that takes a day, start with that. Obviously. Uh, after that, if you have a bunch of very quick ones, you know, that you can close up in a, in a day or two, usually it's worth to do those quickly because they're out of the way after that. And then you can start to tackle the, the big meat, you know, the, the juicy ones that will take a few, a bit more time, like a week and over a week to implement that are bigger changes that, that need more, uh, more bigger investments in order to accomplish uh, or, uh, you know, that are bigger overall. Um, and also you want to propose a target work. When I say propose a target workflow, it's basically the same kind of diagram I showed you before, where you see the whole process flow. You want to propose one, which is the final, you know, the way that things should work once everything is implemented. Um, obviously you want to have as little bottlenecks as possible and you want it to be as clean and as direct as possible, but you also want to make sure that you cover everything that was being done and that you you know that you answer all of the business needs with that new proposed workflow um type of uh yeah action items uh talk a little bit about those it can be changing the way that people use technology uh, it can be about introducing new technology to your station and to your operations it can be about documentations or, or checklists uh, often uh, we found that uh, you know, operators, they're fairly technical and technicians even more. So everyone has an expertise. So if there's no standardized way of working, everyone will find a way that works for them, but they're also working slightly differently. And what's happening if in that situation is it will work, but you will sometimes find bugs. You know, one person will have more problem than the other. And you wonder why, you know, and when you start scratching, you realize they work slightly differently. So maybe the way that one does has more possible problems. And also the more, uh, the bigger the team, the bigger those slight uh, different ways of people working can introduce problems because if one person is sick, you know, the other person can't fully take, uh, take her place and uh, step in to, to do the work because they don't know how it's being done. Um, also, uh, it's important to understand that when I'm talking about checklists and documentation, it's, it's also a question of balance. You don't want to have you know, a checklist that is so precise that you know, it's a script, literally, where you tell the person every tiny step. That's too much. It's more about you know, the larger steps that they must not forget and how to tackle or view a, a certain task and to make sure that everyone works relatively the same way. You don't want to go at the level of details, you know, like, you click here, you click here, click here, wait five seconds, then click here. It, you know, people are still, uh, are, uh, are knowledgeable about their fields and you wanna let them the latitude to work the best they want, but you still need to have a certain level of uh, frame in order to ensure everyone works the same way. Also, automating things that can be automated. Um, 
And that's one that sometimes scares people because you know they they figure oh well, you want to replace me with a computer that that's not it um you know ai is growing and it's getting better and better however it's far from being at the level of a human uh, anyone who's chatted with a bot you know uh, online for tech support can tell you that the experience is uh, far from rewarding from the customer's point of view um, so when we're talking about automating, we're talking about automating stuff that is uninteresting, highly repetitive, and that does not require human judgment in, in order to be accomplished. Um, typical example, you know, I talked about manufacturing before. Imagine, you know, those conveyors and let's say you have uh, soft drinks in power, you know, going on to that very, very fast. If you sit someone in front of the conveyor to just look at the ball to see, you know, and in order for him to validate, there's no bottle that's missing any liquid into it. You know, they're passing by at about uh, 500 uh, bottles uh, per second. The person, well, first of all, if he sees anything, he's got a very good eye. Um, and also, what's, what's the point, you know, besides trying to give that person uh, uh, a seizure or something because he's looking too, too closely at very fast moving pieces, you know? Uh, that is something that can be, you can use a sensor for that very effectively and take that person and move in to do some other task, which has a higher, um, higher return on investment, meaning that it will bring more value to the business. For instance, he can be in charge of monitoring those sensors and then going down and fixing that problem. That needs, you know, a human because you need judgment in order to identify specifically which ball to take it out and to decide what to do with it. So it, it's all about those things and about identifying what can be automated and automating them the right way as well. Um, after that, once uh, you know, once we've uh, we've uh, proposed a layout, and as I was saying, a time frame is important. Make sure that you always have a a proposed time frame to make sure that you know what time you have to work with. And once you start doing the change, a change management is really the key and highly important. You need to inform everyone. Everyone needs to know, you know, what is coming. There is nothing worse than you know knowing that someone is going to do changes, but you have no clue what it's going to be. And there's some concrete examples in the past that have been documented, you know, of uh, people thinking they were about all to be laid off, that the company was doing badly, and in the end, it was very like minor cosmetic change. You know, they were going to repaint the walls and very you know minor stuff, but no one bothered to tell the employees what was going on. All they saw was, you know, people coming in, putting all the stuff in boxes, moving them out of the room, and that's how rumors start. Um, when doing change management, training is extremely important. You need to train, give training to people, making sure that some people are a little bit less technical, others highly so. Make sure that there's training available so that the people that are a little bit less technical are, be, are not left behind. Um, you give you need to give them the help they need basically to adapt and to grow with the business. Um, nothing worse, you know, than coming in one morning and being told, oh, from today we now do things this way. Forget about the old way. Bye. <laughs> and the person walks away. You know, you need to give the information, give them training, and give them time to adapt, to learn the way of doing the new, the new way of doing things. And also you need to have regular feedbacks from workers. That's very important because the same is the same reason as for when you do the analysis, you want to talk back to the same workers, because if you don't, you may have problems that you do not see, but they know, but they never told you. So it, information needs to flow both ways in order to make sure that you do the change at the right pace. And that is really a key element when implementing the changes, because if you do the changes too slowly, then nothing really changes and people who are you know you're the best people who really want to have a change they just go oh nothing will change anyway and then they just disengage and you lose those key actors that could have helped you with the change do the change too quickly without you know giving them time people time to adapt to learn and to find out how to do those new tasks then you're going to spend actually more time fighting the people who fight the change than actually doing the change. So it's a question of a delicate balance and the answer varies from uh, organization to organization. Uh, you know, some businesses are used to very fast turnover, other work a little bit more slowly. 
And honestly, one recipe is not necessarily better than the other. They all have uh, strengths and weaknesses, but the, the takeaway here is really you need to, as a person you know, implementing those changes and proposing those changes, it's your job to, in the, to know what is the right pace and to make sure that that right pace is being kept all throughout the project. Um, I'll finish up with a few common areas specific to broadcast that we often see possible improvements. File format is one that comes to mind all the time. And everyone, anyone who's technical in the broadcast world you know, knows the big difference between having a, a master in H.264 between having a master in DVC Pro HD. There are pros and cons. Rendering will, time will change. You have time to transcode. It depends on what format you're broadcasting. If you have to you know, transcode three times before going on air, it adds a lot of time. Um, file size can be an issue as well. Uh, that brings us to file transfer method. Um, FTP, hard drive, uh, tapes. Some people are still using tapes or archiving tapes uh, for like digital tapes, I meant. Um, there, uh, there are other protocols out there that can be used to transfer files more efficiently or and that can allow you to save time. Uh, and when I say file transfer, it can also be, it's not necessarily a technological solution, as in if you have, let's say, a remote studio and you have a bicycle, uh, a guy on a bicycle, you know, bringing you the tape, well, that is your file transfer method. Uh, probably it's not the fastest and most reliable, but depending on situation, maybe it's what you have. So you, there are there is room for improvement. Reports. Uh, that's one that usually where we see a lot of uh, wasted energy um, because most people see a report. You know, you see a nice report. You don't always see all the time and effort and energy that is being poured into generating that report. Um, so that's why it's important, you know, to make sure that the reporting that you are doing is needed and it's done the right way. Sometimes there are, you know, you have two separate reports that look different, but they actually have the same information. So sometimes you can merge them and, you know, instead of having to have two people do the same report twice, each one, so you're doing the work twice, you can generate one report that will answer the need of both uh, people. Um, and that applies to whether it be regulatory reports or internal reports. And non-standardized ways of working, I've already touched about that one. As, was, uh, as I was mentioning before, it causes confusion and it generates problem. Um, the classical uh, you know, uh, example of a problem that uh, of a non-standardized way of working, for instance, someone does task A and B, the other does B and, or and A, both orders should work, but it happens that in the software you use, if you do B followed by A, there's a bug and it crashes. It's not the, the, the worker's fault. The, it, there is a bug, but if everyone is working you know, in the same general order, you minimize the possibility of discovering those bugs, uh, which is something, you know, as a, as a broadcast operator, you want to leave a quality control and software uh, software quality control to the manufacturer. You don't want to do it yourself and find the bugs for them. Um, so the, the key, the, the way of avoiding finding bugs is really to make sure everyone works in a similar way. So I hope you find the presentation uh, interesting. Uh, it's a very broad uh, subject. Uh, I could talk about uh, a lot longer than this, but I wanted to keep this uh, short and uh, under an hour. Uh, so I hope you found it interesting. And was there any? Does anyone have any questions? All right. So uh, large silence. So I assume no one has questions, or I've uh, completely bored everyone out. <laughs> yes, Tom. Yeah. Um, so. I, I got your three steps, and I think they're very, very important to identify. But I also was curious, uh, there must be a broad range of costs for this kind of stuff. The, yes. I was thinking of, um, do you have a ballpark range for what it costs for workflow analysis? Uh, that it, step it, seems to be the most critical to me. Actually, for, for uh, when you want to um, estimate the cost, it's all about the goals and the scope. Because you know, if you have a scope that you only work, let's say with master control, then who are you gonna to talk to in master control? There's gonna be a couple of operators. You're gonna to talk maybe to a few people in traffic and probably a few like the technical 
people around master control. So that's about 10 people, let's say, in a smaller station. So it's not the same thing as if you want to look at the whole station, how sales are working. So, you know, because the more people you look at and the broader the scope, the more time you need to talk to all of those people. So it's it's really, there's no, there's no you know, like a cookie cutters kind of way of doing that. It's really, when we do that kind of work, I need to talk with the customer to establish you know, how many people are we talking about, what number of departments, and then how deep we want to go into their operations. Um, but yes, it can be very costly. And if you look in other fields, uh, like in, uh, in business analysis, for instance, uh, companies like KPNG will charge you hundreds of thousands, even millions to do it for your business. You know, if you're, so it, uh, it, it comes, I would say, usually you will need, the smallest you you can do it is about the 50 to 100 hours of work under that you know even if you're very small then you're starting to be too small to make it work um and you know at 100 hours of actual work on a project it's a small project very narrow uh, usually with a customer that you already know about so that you know you have an idea of their operation you don't have to learn anything so but it varies a lot yes you're right that's uh, that's where the art is how to estimate that uh, dare i say in this post-covid world you know because probably not over but uh does it require travel to the site for for you or whoever's consulting yeah i would say so uh, honestly someone who tells you that he's going to do it all remotely i, I mean might work, but in my experience, if you don't travel to the site, you're relying too much on second-hand information. So, you know, everyone here has probably experienced in their career the telephone game. You know, someone tells something to someone, tells it to a third person, uh, and, you know, the information you have to get at the end is always twisted. And in that kind of work, it's important that you really understand the real information. So, yes, you can do a part of it remotely, uh, but you will need to go on site for some of it. And I, I guess uh, to verify that implementation has taken place and you got the results you want, you can't just take a, a, a quick meeting and say, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> no, exactly. And it also depends on when we're talking about gold before, it depends also the type of organization you're working with. Sometimes, you know, they, they want to have that external eye to do the work of analysis and proposing change, but they have internal people that are going to be able to implement them and you may only be called on you know, once or twice to give them a hand on, on understanding what they do. Other times, we're the one you know, driving the changes, not necessarily on a daily basis, but we're a lot more involved. So that also drive, you know, comes into account when we're talking about costs, what level of involvement once, we, you know, once the, the plan is laid out, how much help do you need to implement? It? Uh, in case somebody else has another question, I'll just make this the last one. Um, where have you, excuse me, <clears throat> where have you seen the greatest, uh, you know, um, um, streamlining of workflow? Uh, is there a trend or is there something that jumps out at you as, oh, this is, this is where we see the best um, well, Yeah, it uh, honestly it varies a lot depending on the organization. I wouldn't say there's like a, a single uh, one. Uh, the, the type of element are the ones I highlighted before, you know, like file format, I would say is one, it's a classic one in broadcast, but that's one, you know, that people have known since we've had digital video servers, basically, you know, because they were, as the, the more transcoding you have, the longer time you have to wait. Um, so that is one that is, uh, but, and usually, you know, most stations, they, they are aware of that. You know, you don't need to tell them about that. You, they may need help to identify what other format could be helpful for them, but they do know that a, a different format will help them <clears throat> or the other way around. Um, I would say one that is mostly overlooked, usually it's more about the reports. Mm. That, that is one I've seen that, you know, it looks kind of uh, unimportant, but uh, I've seen a lot of places that throw a lot of resources, and I mean a lot, uh, into generating those reports. Uh, and sometimes it's all, it's just a question of, you know, 
they can use a slightly different tools. For instance, um, I'm sure most of you know about like Crystal Report, which is a tool used to generate reports. Uh, some places they you they have manual ways like they actually take like a data from a, a CSV file, they format it in an Excel, they use Excel to export it to uh, into a word, and they format that to generate the report. It's all manual. Whereas if you use a tool like Crystal Report, you can automate a lot of those tasks as long as you have a data source that is machine consumable. Um, because some at some places they get the report, you know, not in a machine readable format like a CSV or XML, they get it like in a PDF. Uh, and not even a PDF that you can copy paste from a PDF that's an image. Yes. So then the person has to literally type back. So th those those kind of uh, and usually you know reports are done by slightly less technical people. They're more administrative people. So they, they will find a way of generating the report they were asked, and they'll do it the best way they know about. But sometimes it will be a time burner, like a crazy time burner. Good, thank you. I hope that helps. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, I'm looking on the chat. I don't see any chat. And Jessica, um, thank you for putting those uh, those things in there. If anybody wants to go to the chat, Jessica put a couple of links in there that uh, are very helpful. So, anybody else have any questions? All right. So uh, I'll uh, finish by telling you uh, thanks for attending. And as you've seen, you know, workflow is really something that is, uh, it's an art. It's not a science. Uh, I'll finish by saying that. And basically, you know, the person doing the analysis is very important. Since it's not a science, everyone will do it slightly differently. Uh, but there are general principles, you know, that you need to know about and to apply. And after that, it's a question of having a good fit between the person doing the work and the organization doing it. Because again, every place is different and every place works differently. And that's what uh, makes it uh, fun, but you know, different. So you can't use the same recipe everywhere. All right, well, Pascal, thank you very much. It was a very, uh, in, very informative presentation. You did a great job with it. And uh, following up at the end of it with the questions is a great job as well. Um, and you're right, workflow management is very tricky. So. And thank you guys very much. Um, Jessica, thank you for reaching out to me on this. Um, again, I thank you both Jessica and Pascal and thank you everybody for coming. And we will try and put this up uh, in, in a day or two so everybody else can watch it and we can share it. So take care everyone. And you have about three minutes left until one o'clock. Perfect, thank you for being there and have a good day.